Well, this morning we're going to start a new series of sermons, um, and it's on the subject of hell. Now, hell is one of those topics that, you know, why, why preach about hell? Is it not just something that we don't really want to have to think about? Well, the main reason that I would preach about hell is because it's in the Bible. And, uh, you know, like the Apostle Paul, who said, you know, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know, I think that um, I wouldn't be doing my job properly as a preacher if I didn't preach on this subject. And also, I think you've got a right to know what the Bible is teaching um, about this particular subject. I think it would be very uh, disingenuous of me to present a gospel that carries no warnings about the consequence of rejecting that gospel. And I know that uh, the doctrine of hell has been misused in the past. Uh, it's been used to manipulate people. But I would say that the misuse of a thing never kind of negates the, the proper use of it. And so I hope that as we go through this new series of sermons on this, on this difficult subject, that um, I can show you how to properly use this doctrine as well, to glorify God and to bring others uh, to Christ. So we're going to have a look, first of all, uh, if you have a Bible with you, I just encourage you to uh, turn to Matthew 23, Gospel of Matthew 23. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word now, I pray that you would open it to us, Lord. I pray that your spirit would come upon me, Lord, that the words that I speak might be your words, might be what you want to say, Lord. And uh, that, that if you want to change me to change direction in what, what I should say, then I pray, Lord, that your spirit would lead me. But through all of it, Lord, I pray that you would be pleased with what is preached. And that the name of Christ would be edified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Matthew 23. And we're going to start reading at verse 27. Let's take a sip of water. Verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed, out, out, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell so here, here's use of that word hell and it's it's being used by the Lord Jesus um, and the word damnation means judgment so Jesus is talking about the judgment that will fall on these religious hypocrites who even though they claim to follow God uh, two things number one they reject the Lord Jesus and his gospel and number two, they continue in sin whilst pretending to be righteous. And these two kind of ideas, uh, they're linked uh, and they're almost synonymous. Because if you reject Jesus Christ as your saviour, then that is a sin. Jesus says in John, John 16, he says that this is the first sin that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of that they believe not on me. So by not believing on Jesus, by not taking him as your saviour, that is sin. And furthermore, to continue in that, in that way, 
Even if you profess that you follow God, that is to continue in sin. It leads to sin. Number one, you haven't taken Christ as your saviour. And number two, you haven't allowed him to be the Lord of your life. If Christ is the Lord of your life, you turn away from sin and you walk in obedience to God through the grace and the power that God gives us through his Holy Spirit. So there are two main aspects or two qualifications that would point a person in the direction of hell. You reject the biblical Christ and you refuse to obey him. But thankfully, by the grace of God, both of those things can be reversed. They can be changed. And I hope this morning, if you're watching this um, and, and you're in that position, I hope that you'll think soberly about uh, changing that position to take Christ as your saviour and, and to also to, to take him as your Lord. So in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually warns about hell uh, three times, even using phrases like hell fire. So, I mean, is this your Jesus? Is this how you picture Jesus talking? So that's how the Bible says he spoke. And, um, and, and the, he gives a warning about the dangers of hell. But who is he warning? Well, let's have a look. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 uh, starts the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's one of the most famous passages where Jesus teaches. It's the longest bit of teaching that we've got that Jesus does. If you have a Bible where um, all the words um, of Jesus are in red, then you'll see it just continues page after page. So um, right at the beginning there, Matthew chapter 5, it says this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Okay, so, so who is he teaching? His disciples. What is he teaching them about? Well, many different things, but amongst them, the dangers of hell. You know, the importance of avoiding hell. So, this is very sobering. You know, I think it's a sobering and a, and a convicting provocation in this doctrine to us as Christians that if Jesus has warned his own disciples about hell, then it's not a subject we can say, oh, I'm a Christian, you know, I've got my ticket to heaven, I don't need to hear about hell. We do. You know, it's important. And as we go through this series, I hope, I hope that it will, you'll see why that is. So again... The, the, the first sermon I'm preaching here this morning, I gave it the title, What is it, that is what is hell, and where is it? So we're going to cover those two points today. What is hell, but where is hell as well? Uh, Matthew 25, 41 describes hell as everlasting fire. Um, and then again in Matthew 22, uh, Jesus talks about hell as outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now how how can a place be both fiery and dark? You know, fire illuminates, doesn't it? If you light a candle in a dark room, it becomes illuminated. Uh, but it seems to be a place that's both fiery and dark. So let's explore some of some of these ideas and also some of the misconceptions about hell. Hell is not the devil's kingdom. Okay, the devil is not in hell. I wish he was. But the Bible says in Job chapter 1 verse 7 that the devil is going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. Um, it doesn't say that the devil's in hell with his demons waiting to punish people. No, that's not, not what the Bible teaches. But hang on, doesn't Jesus talk about his church saying that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That makes you think, do you think like, you know, the gates of hell could be like Satan and his, and the fallen angels and they're fighting against the church, uh, but they're not going to prevail. That's the way a lot of preachers would, would actually translate that. But that, that gets us into all kinds of problems because the devil isn't in hell. Hell is a place of punishment. The Bible says that hell was made actually for the devil and his angels. It was made to punish them. 
So, so how do we make sense of that verse where Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church? Well, what Jesus is doing is actually quoting from the Old Testament. So have a look at it, Isaiah 38. So Isaiah 38, verse 9. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. So did you see it there? Did you catch it in verse 10? I shall go to the gates of the grave or the gates of Sheol. Uh, so, so what it's saying really is, and, and you'll see this a lot, how we use the word hell, how, how the English translation uses that word, is that it's actually talking about the grave, uh, going beyond this life. And what Jesus is saying is, that corruption of the grave, that dying, is never going to happen to his church. His church will never die. It will live forever. You know, death and destruction and, and, and corruption and the rotting away of something, that's never going to prevail against Christ's church. It's just going to go on and on and on forever. It will never come a day where there is no church. Um, and, and that's the proper meaning of the text. So Satan is not the ruler of hell. Uh, hell will be his prison he and all the fallen angels with him, and they will be punished there for eternity. Now, hell is not down under the earth. You can't dig down and eventually, oh, look, there's hell. You know, this is, and the, the reasons why sometimes people have these, these concepts, which we'll have a look at. You know, what, well, what about all those Old Testament verses that talk about going down into the earth? That, you know, when you die, I'll be put down in the earth. Well, what happens when you die? You're buried. You go down into the earth, right? Um, so, partly the reason why people think or, or have this impression that hell is somewhere down under the earth is to do with Roman Catholicism, right? So, like, in the 1300s, there was this epic poem that was written uh, called The Divine Comedy. And uh, in the Divine Comedy, there's a character called Dante. And Dante is led by another character called Virgil. And he goes through these different kind. He goes down under the earth and he goes through these different layers. So there's one layer called Purgatory. So you can see straight, straight away the Roman Catholic concept there. He goes through Purgatory. And he goes through another layer called the Inferno. Uh, and so you might have heard the phrase Dante's Inferno. Right, so this is where it comes from. It's a big, really, really popular poem, but it's fiction. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's just a kind of fictional um, work. Hell is actually not down under the earth. Hell is another dimension, if you can imagine that. It exists at the same time uh, that, that our earth exists, but it's kind of another uh, dimension. Uh, and in fact, the word hell is of Saxon origin. It means concealed or hidden. It's a place that we can't see, but it is nonetheless real. Now, the third misconception is a translational issue. So if you have a, a, a King James Version, we'll call it the authorised version uh, in England, um, and, and you compare it with a modern version, you'll find far more references in this version that I've got, the King James, than you will find in a modern version. And, and this has led some people to assume that the, the translators of the authorised version got it wrong. They, they missed something. They, they didn't realise that, that actually there are different words that the, the Greek and the Hebrew uses, and they just made this mistake. They just saw everywhere they saw this word, they'd be like, okay, hell, hell, put that as hell. And, and it's kind of amusing in a way to me that, that if you just think about it for a moment, most of the people who say this to me, they can't even read Greek, never mind translate Greek. 
but they're like, oh yeah, well I can see what's happened here, you know, the, the King James translators, they, they got it wrong, didn't they? The translators of the authorised version of the Bible were the cream of the crop. I mean, they were the top scholars of their day. So, for example, uh, the, there's a guy, uh, Sir Henry Savile. He's the guy who translates the Gospels from the Greek into English, right? Now, he was the personal tutor of Queen Elizabeth I. Now, do you think she's going to have some shoddy Greek translator who's like, oh, yeah, I know a bit of Greek. She's going to have the best in England, isn't she? She's going to have the very best of the best. And, and that's what these translators were. And so the idea that somebody who can't even speak Greek, let alone translate it, could spot something that one of these guys didn't see is just absurd. Of course they saw that there were different words here. Okay, and, and, and there are basically four different words uh, in the original languages that the English translation, the King James Version, translates as hell. And it's not out of ignorance that they're translated as hell. What you need to understand is the authorised version uses the word hell in a different way to newer versions uh, have started using it. Right, so originally hell was just that word that I gave to you in Saxon, you know, that kind of concept, something that's hidden, something that's beyond the grave, right? And, and that word incorporates this place of everlasting fire and eternal punishment. But in modern translations, it just simply means, on the whole, depending on what your translation is, tends to mean the word Gehenna, uh, meaning the, the lake of fire, that final place of punishment. So I'll explain as we go through. There are four words, Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. Now, Sheol is the Old Testament name for Hades, the realm of the dead. Okay, and, and so there is a bad part to Hades and a good part to Hades. And you'll see this in Luke 16, do you know where the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man goes into this place of torment, but Lazarus goes into this place that's called Abraham's bosom, and it's sort of like a holding place. It's, it's just this, this, this place where there's a gap between the two and you can't cross from one side uh, to, to the other. And the authorised version translates that as hell. But remember, it's not saying this is the lake of fire, this is the final judgment. It's just saying, yeah, that incorporates this word. And I've even heard preachers who have been so taken up with this kind of Roman Catholic concept that, that hell is down under the earth... I heard one preacher, quite a well-known preacher and published writer, say that the earth has a hole that goes right through the middle of it, he thinks, and sort of pops out the other side. So imagine a kind of donut kind of thing. Now, he doesn't say where this hole is or where this shaft is, but he said on one side of this hole under the earth, there's a room that's kind of all fiery and, and, and that's where the bad people are. And then on the other side of this hole... There's a room that is, quote, air-conditioned, and that's where good people go. I mean, it's just, you know, it sounds like journey to the centre of the earth. It's not in the earth, okay? This is another dimension, this is a spiritual dimension here that we're talking about. It's not in the centre of the earth. And I've heard other people who've picked up on that, see, why, why I'm telling you this is because this has repercussions. Once people hear that, they actually join on to that and they, they invent their own doctrines. I've heard people say that when uh, Noah's flood came, right, and all, all, only the eight people on the ark were saved, okay, and that everybody else perished, they say that some wicked people found that hole in the ground and they went down into the hole and they somehow escaped the flood. And that when the flood was over, they came back out of that hole. Now, what are the problems with that? Well, there are do massive doctrinal problems because the ark is a picture of Christ, isn't it? So that all who are in the ark were saved. All who are in Christ will be saved. Everybody who's outside of Christ will perish. But they're saying, oh no, there's some people who didn't perish. But that just kind of turns the whole atonement and the idea of salvation in Christ alone on its head. So while some of these ideas might seem a little uh, 
preposterous. I have to deal with them because I think they have repercussions for people who, who want to understand other parts of the Bible. And you'll see that as we go through the series. We'll be looking at lots of other parts of the Bible and how they follow on from a true understanding of what the doctrine of hell is. So, um, Hades is simply the realm of the dead. There's a good part, there's a bad part, but it's simply the realm of the dead. Once we understand that, when you read things like Acts 2.27 and Psalm 16 where it says thou will not leave my soul in hell it, you understand it's not referring to a place of hell fire so like Jesus could say you'll uh, you know quoting David that will not leave my soul in hell saying you know the father will not leave him in that realm of the dead but he'll be resurrected David could say it you will not leave me in that realm of the dead that place but you will resurrect me. That's all it's saying. Okay? That's all it's saying. And, and it's again understanding how the authorised version of the Bible uses uh, the word the word hell. So it's simply a dimension, a place where the dead are. Uh, now Tartarus or Tartaro is a place for the wicked dead, and Gehenna is a place of fiery torment so hence when you read revelation 20 14 it says death and hell or death and hades were cast into the lake of fire again the authorized version uses the word hell and you might say well that's just wrong it shouldn't do that you know it it it, it should be translated hell it should be translated hades well firstly hades is not a translation it's just all the, the modern Bible versions do is they just leave them untranslated. So you've got Hades, Gehenna, Sheol. They're the original words. Okay, at least, at least the authorised version tries to translate them into English. And I've even heard some people say, well, I don't like the word hell. You know, I don't think it's right because it's Saxon. It's kind of pagan. And I don't want a pagan word in my Bible. My answer to that is, well, what do you think Hades is? Now, Nathaniel here is a bit of an expert on Greek mythology. Who or what is Hades in Greek mythology? Um, well, in Greek mythology, it's the uh, god of the dead and also the name of the realm of the dead where all the dead people Yeah, dead. right. So, so Hades is the name of the god of the dead, right? And, and also his, his place, his kingdom. So you can see perhaps where there's some misunderstanding, misconcepts of what um, hell is so that this is how language works right and the fact that we have one english word that's used for four different words in the original language is not unusual so for example in a modern translation like the niv first corinthians 13 says if i speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love well, well which love is it is it agape eros Philia, they're all different words in Greek, separate words, but we just use one word in English, and that's the word love. So it's not unusual to have different words in the original language, and then just to kind of say, okay, we'll use one English word to describe it, and it's this word, hell. So I hope you can see that, I hope you understand that that's how uh, this translation works. Every time it says hell, it's not talking about the lake of fire, it's not talking about the final punishment and once you get that and I hope you've got that now once you get that if you're using an authorized version of the Bible you'll start to understand okay so the context will tell me how this word is being is being used um, right so it should become clear when you read through the scriptures when you read about everything that it has to say about hell that the end of the wicked is not annihilation it's not like well they were wicked in life therefore God is just going to destroy them and they're gone they're gone from the face of the earth that's not what the Bible rejects and again I'll make it clear what I mean by wicked those who reject Christ and those those who reject him as saviour and those who reject Christ 
as Lord and continue to do so. Because the great thing is what the Bible tells us is you can repent, you can turn away from that. You can turn back to God. In fact, that it says in Isaiah 55, isn't it? let the wicked uh, forsake his ways and let him return unto the Lord. So, so you, can, you can do that. God will empower you to turn from your sins and turn back to him. In fact, that is the call of the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1, 15. So it's not annihilation. God is not just going to destroy wicked people and that's it. You've gone. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 and uh, verse... We'll start at verse 6. Start at verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is, is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now listen. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, their smoke is going to ascend forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. That's not annihilation, is it's not like, they're gone. Right, this is a, this is a, a serious, solemn, sober warning. And isn't it interesting that Christ himself even warned his own disciples about the danger of hell. He said, look, if your hand is leading you into sin, cut it off if your eye is leading you into sin. Pluck it out. It doesn't mean literally. But if, if there's someone that's close to you, as close as your hand or your eye, that you feel is indispensable, yet they're leading you into hell. They're leading along that path of sin. Cut them off. Cut them out of your life. Because it's better to go, go on without them than to find yourself in hell, in that place. You better just digest that. Just, just think about it for a moment. This place is real. It's real. And some of you need to decide whether you are for Christ or against him. Whether you're for Christ or against him. You know, Christ is sometimes called a rock of offence or a stone of stumbling. And some people find Christ's gospel, which includes the doctrine of hell, it causes them to stumble, it causes them to be offended by it. And that's quite normal, because the things that Jesus Christ said offended people in his day, particularly religious people, people who affected uh, a belief in God. But inside, like the Pharisees, like we read right at the beginning, they're full of dead men's bones. They're full of all rottenness and sin. On the outside, it looks very respectable, but it's inside, it's in the heart. So what the, the, the doctrine of hell does is it, it confronts those people, those hypocrites, with the end of their life. It's saying, look, if you continue in this way, without the true life of Christ in you, this is your end. 
this is where you will end up. It's a warning. It's meant to pull us up. It's meant to shock us. It's meant to stop us in our tracks and make us think, wow, in the light of this, these eternal consequences, I better get right with God. And so this morning, I hope if you're going down that road, if you're drifting in to that way of living, I hope that it wakes you up this morning. Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give you light. He'll shine upon you. Christ is the rock of offence, the stone of stumbling. Just go to Matthew 21. I'm going to finish with the scripture. Matthew 21. And we're going to start reading from verse 44. This is Christ talking about the kingdom of God. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What's that talking about? This is what I believe it's saying. Either you can fall on Christ, that rock, that stone. Either you can fall on Christ, a broken spirit, with a broken and a contrite heart. Or Christ will fall on you in judgment. That's the challenge. Well, you've got, the cho you've got a choice. You can choose. Either you will fall upon Christ with your broken heart, your broken spirit, or one day he will fall upon you in judgment. You must choose heaven or hell, eternal life or eternal punishment. You must choose. I would say this to you this morning. Choose soon. Because the Bible says we are not promised tomorrow. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for your word. Sometimes it's difficult to hear your word Lord and even to apply it to our lives. But I pray Lord that you would help all of us be more sober and understanding about this doctrine of hell. Lord, that we might even apply it, not just to other people, but to our own selves, Lord, to our own lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.